Hey guys, I'm Kate. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to the video where I'm going to try writing like Neil Gaiman, but not his routine as I've done before. I'm going to try actually writing like Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. So first let me explain the origin of this. I have done a lot of I Tried Writing Like videos where I test out the routines of famous authors, mostly just to play around and see if there's anything that might actually work for me too. And I've gotten comments from the very beginning being like, I thought you were going to actually write like this person, meaning in their style. And those comments buried deep into the recesses of my brain, <laughs> sort of waiting, not really showing themselves until I started listening to the Steal Like an Artist trilogy. Y'all have probably heard the saying, good artists borrow, great artists steal, attributed mostly to T.S. Eliot, but also sometimes Picasso and a couple other people. <laughs> There's other iterations of this, like one from Igor Stravinsky saying that a good composer does not imitate, he steals. And then of course there is the classic, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Now if you actually look at the larger context of these quotes, no one is actually suggesting stealing nor copying, but there is a lot to learn from analyzing the work of authors that you admire and sort of figuring out why exactly their writing speaks to you. Is it how they break common rules? Is it how they twist tropes? Is it their flow, their pacing, how they manipulate language, any number of things, right? So I put a poll up to my patrons asking them to choose between my top five most popular I tried writing like videos or the authors that those videos were about, yes, with the goal to write like the author for a whole week and they chose Neil Gaiman. So really this experiment is going to entail reading Neil Gaiman's work every day, even taking a cue from the Steal Like an Artist trilogy and actually handwriting or typing out passages of his work that I really, really love or really speak to me, kind of like embedding it in your brain, analyzing what I think differentiates Neil from other authors that I've read. And at the end of the week, I'm going to write a short story in his style. And for the fun of it at the end, and I will also copy and paste my story over into I Write Like and see which author I will pop up with, hopefully Neil Gaiman. <laughs> really the whole point of this is just to play around with language, read a lot, write a lot, get myself out of my comfort zone and see what I can learn and have fun with it. So first step first, we gotta go get some books. And actually one of my favorite things about Neil Gaiman, one of the reasons that I so look up to him is that he has written in so many different genres, so many different age categories. He's done comics, he's written screenplays, he's dabbled in short stories, novels, you know, he really has, if not done at all, done a whole lot of it. <laughs> My bag is very heavy. <laughs> I have like three different booktube videos that I wanted to do. And so I got all the books for all of them in at the same time. <laughs> but this week's all about Neil Gaiman. So I think step one is to actually go through all the first chapters of the books that I picked out and I selected a variety. Observe the stack. First up, Neil Gaiman's Stardust. Next, I have The Graveyard Book. I also grabbed Norse Mythology and Good Omens, which might be a little bit different since we've got Terry Pratchett on there too. And this one more for writing inspiration. It is The View from the Cheap Seats, which is an enthralling collection of nonfiction pieces on myriad topics from art and artists to dreams, myths, and memories to comics, films, and literature. Observed an award-winning number one New York Times bestselling author Neil Gaiman's probing, amusing, and distinctive style. Probing, amusing, distinctive. Uh, it'll be interesting to see when I'm done with this experiment how I would categorize Neil Gaiman's writing, and I, I'm sure I probably would agree with those words. But I'm excited to find out what I think separates him from other authors that I really enjoy. So I'm going to save this one for a little bit later and get to the first chapters on these four. Okay, I wrote down the like 
an entire page of notes because I really loved so many elements of this opening chapter. Um, I think this one's a little bit unfair of an example, though this is what I've noticed in the past with Neil Gaiman stuff that I've read, or at least some of the short stories, is that it does feel very much like a fairy tale uh, in the way that it's I can hear it. It's one of my favorite things about N.K. Jemisin's books too, or her writing style, which is like, I feel like I'm being told a story. Like I could be sitting around a campfire and it's almost like a masterful orator is performing kind of thing. That's what it feels like to read it. It, it flows so beautifully and Neil Gaiman stuff does the same thing. Just Flows. What I found particularly interesting was how he changed up the dialogue. You could tell the kind of fairy folk versus the townspeople. There were also a couple times where he sort of switched up the description. I found his description, like there's a lot of description in that fairy tale-esque way, but it doesn't feel like it's being bogged down. Like no individual sentence or anything is bogged down. It really just paints a beautiful picture, which I think is masterful because I feel like a lot of writing I read I get bogged down by the description but I don't feel that way at all with his. But for example of the things that he sort of like switches it up a bit. At that time Dunstan Thorne was 18 and he was not a romantic. He had nut brown hair and nut brown eyes and nut brown freckles. He was middling tall and slow of speech. I did highlight only one paragraph that tripped me up and that I would change it were I being nitpicky, which sounds atrocious to nitpick something that was so beautifully done. But like if I'm trying to analyze the work for what I liked, I got tripped up at one point. So like that's when I would edit it and it was this one. He had an easy smile which illuminated his face from within and he dreamed, when he daydreamed in his father's meadow, of leaving the village of Ball and all its unpredictable charm and going to London or Edinburgh. And I get hung up on the, and he dreamed, when he daydreamed in his father's meadow. Just the first time I read it. <laughs> but. I also had so many that I loved. So I'm going to be taking a lot of these to kind of get the repetition down and type it out and kind of feel it out. Uh, I haven't figured out what short story I want to write, but I am thinking of fairy tale esque maybe starring <laughs> my Veneth tea kitten. Or my precious sleepy Buffy. Or my silly little sausage with the sock she stole. Yeah. I do really want to read this whole book now though, so that's probably what I'm going to be doing this week. <laughs> so anyways, I'll play around with it. I'm just going to let that ruminate. And now I think it's time for something totally different, and we're going to go to Good Omens, which my partner said he absolutely adored. I'm only like eight pages in and I'm already mad in the same way that when I was reading Mort, it just made me mad how brilliant Terry Pratchett is and I am feeling it again. <laughs> I'm just mad. Mad that someone could be this good. Mad that I will never get there. And yet at the same time, it is the best thing ever because of course I do not want to stop reading. <laughs> how dare they. <laughs> Okay, I'm on page 23. And besides just being continually mad at the greatness, <laughs> uh, I did realize that, I don't know if you can hear the flip of those pages, some hearty flips. What I'm calling the first chapter doesn't end until page 64, um, but I feel like I have a good grasp of this one. So what I'm gonna do is take my notes and go ahead and type up the passages, the paragraphs that really stood out to me that I was really, you know, blown away by, whether that was in a greater context of what I'd read or if it was just individual lines. And then I'll do the same for the other two books. What's gonna be interesting is I wanna do it both typing, since often the way I draft is typing and not handwriting, but I'd also like to do it handwriting. So really there's just gonna be a lot of transcribing. <laughs> Darth Vader is similarly excited about my transcribing work. <laughs> All right. 
right. And I did go ahead and put the one that I was a little bit confused by and exactly where I was confused by it. But as of right now, I have typed out a thousand and nine words from both Stardust and Good Omens and a total of one, two, sixteen distinct passages spread out amongst the chapters. On to the next. So one of the things that I really liked, okay, page 32, one of the many things I love. I, I love Neil Gaiman's use of commas. You can get away with stuff that I think other people couldn't. Again, this kind of like, a lyrical's not even the word I would use. It just sounds like someone telling me the story, but like in a really amazing way. But I find this most evident, his ability to kind of change things up and make it interesting while also still like laying it out. Odin and his brothers made the soil from Mir's flesh. Mir's bones they piled up into mountains and cliffs. Our rocks and pebbles, the sand and gravel you see, these were Mir's teeth and the fragments of bones that were broken and crushed by Odin and Vili and Ve in their battle with Mir. The seas that girdle the world, these were Mir's blood and sweat. Look up into the sky, you are looking into the inside of Ymir's skull. The stars you see at night, the planets, all the comets and the shooting stars, these are the sparks that flew from the fires of Muspel. And the clouds you see by day, these were once Ymir's brains. And who knows what thoughts they are thinking, even now. Even though basically it's from this is this now, like that's what's being shared, it's done in such a way that it's not boring, continues to be interesting, slight variations, but at times it's the exact same rhythm. So it's just, yes. Um, I do find this one fairly reminiscent. In some ways it's interesting because we started with who the characters are. Just like in Good Omens, we have a section about who the characters are, but because it's telling tales, it kind of feels more like stardust in this way. So anyways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But now, time for a pivot to the graveyard book. And look at this illustration. Oh my God. And then it was time to write out and type out all of my favorite passages. The quotes that really stood out to me that I'd like to emulate. ready to write a short story in Neil Gaiman's style. I am deciding to go more of the fairy tale route in part because I think two of the stories that I read kind of fell under that sharing like myths and legends and it is a different voice but also because I think it is particularly well suited to a short story format and I've been trying to think over I joked at the beginning that I would tell a story about like my animals or something but actually what I think I'm going to do is that I see this wasp on my window and it's reminding me of the garden outside and I have been trying to revive um, our little magnolia tree. We have not been successful so far, but like hopefully we're doing the right things to get it there. I do think it would be interesting to tell a little story almost of this backyard. Like it could survive without our intervention and it it would it might look different without humans being there right or even the humans that came before us so that's vaguely the concept as i'm still staring at this wasp <laughs> haven't exactly figured out like a beginning middle end but the lore oh or maybe the humans are bad and that is the story <laughs> a little bit more grim hmm. anyways let's get started my computer is actually not that far. Ooh. So 
what was supposed to be only a week-long experiment has turned into like a every couple days once a week experiment. You can see that July 18th is when I started and I did a little bit on July 19th as you can see now. Can you see now? As you can see now it's July 28th. <laughs> I was gone for about a week though so pardoning that. Oh which I did bring good omens on my trip to comic-con so you know I still had Still had Neil Gaiman with me a little bit and he was there. I did not see him, but he was there. <laughs> but you can see some of what I've done and I want to just show you some of the bits. You can tell it's obviously like I have a whole bunch of brackets still. So today is going to be tidying the story up and completing it. But the idea is on the page, more or less. But I want to show you some of the concepts from Stardust that you can see in here. Okay, the bits about the crowd shouting out what you can get. I have bits here of just back-to-back -back dialogue from people viewing the backyard in my scene. Then, I think I need to do a little bit more than green, but I'm trying to put a bit in here where it's just the same color descriptor, like when Dunstan Thorn is introduced. And I'm hoping that a few of the others will have a kind of tempo that is similar in style to Neil Gaiman's. Now, this is the interesting thing is that obviously Neil Gaiman's not the first to have done anything like this. Again, we're all doing more or less the same thing and trying to tell a story. So I don't know that this is necessarily the most unique to Neil Gaiman, though I do think he has a unique voice. When I was talking to a friend, I don't know if she'd want me to say who she is. She probably doesn't care. Um, but she was saying how she thought Neil Gaiman has like, his writing just felt a bit uppity, like a little bit snobby, almost as if he knows he's great. And so it's just like too much. <laughs> which I think is a valid criticism. And I just think it's funny how we all resonate with different things. I know for her and she really loves N.K. Jemisin. So when I'm likening some of Neil Gaiman's writing, giving me the same feels N.K. Jemisin's, um, not the same style, but the same feel, you know, I'm sure she would disagree. <laughs> so anyways, yes, just very interesting. All right, let us finish up the story and then enter it in to our very serious irate leg. <laughs> Okay, I think I have completed the story. I did go ahead and change that green to a classic emerald. And then I really focused on trying to do like sort of, not compounding commas, what am I trying to say? <laughs> Lots of commas in the sentences and just kind of see if I can't flow like that. For example, one of the paragraphs, Magnolia could not blame her keeper. He'd done his very best and helped her grow so very tall, stretching out far beyond her imagination as a seedling. But now her roots ached and shriveled underneath the dry ground. Her leaves turned brittle and brown. She longed for a sip of water, a taste, but she went parched for days, for weeks, sometimes months. Skipping around a bit. We also have cries rattled their leaves, but their anguish was carried away with the wind, not to be heard by the humans, the creatures who couldn't care to listen, who couldn't be bothered to try. Little elements where it's like five commas in one sentence sort of thing. <laughs> Let's see, one, two, three, four commas in that one sentence. Uh, I'm trying here. <laughs> so now we're going to take this very short, approximately 620 word story. And finally test out if I successfully wrote like Neil Gaiman. Select all, copy, and paste. Analyze. Ooh. No! <laughs> I mean, the plus side of this little website is that no matter what, you get a famous author and that's like fun and nice and whatever. And I quite like Margaret Atwood, but like, no. This is when I confess that I did halfway through the story, just the finished sentences that I'd done, did check to see and I got Margaret Atwood full four. So I did not even make it more like Neil Gaiman. Oh well, I shall keep my, <laughs> my quotes. And I guess finish off by saying that I found this experiment really fun, even though ultimately I did not meet the metric of success that I set up. I really enjoyed the entire process of diving into a particular author's work, reading the opening chapters, continuing on in some particular books, trying to identify what makes his style unique, what makes any author's style unique. I remember when I was growing up that I read um, before Young Adult was really Young Adult. I read a lot of Meg Cabot books. The Mediator series is still one of my favorite series. And she had a particular style that I still find myself using sometimes when I'm writing in first person. 
I can fully attest it to her. And to that end, when I'm trying to write certain genres, I will actually stop reading in those genres, at least for that specific time of drafting. I don't need to worry about it with outlining. I don't need to worry about it with revision too much, but like those drafting times, I, I don't want to have that little osmosis effect of taking in certain sayings um, or certain styles and, and bleeding that onto the page. You know, it's not all of it is purposely done, but I know it about myself. Um, I'm a little bummed that when I tried specifically to do it, that it did not work. <laughs> But it was fun either way. Oh, and I did read The View from the Cheap Seats or I skimmed around it. That is the book that was the kind of compilation of essays, speeches, etc. that Neil Gaiman has given, mostly about the creative process. And I wanted to pull a quote that was very specific to this instance, which is the urge starting out is to copy. And that's not a bad thing. Most of us only find our own voices after we've sounded like a lot of other people. But the one thing you have that nobody else has is you your voice, your mind, your story, your vision. So write and draw and build and play and dance and live as only you can. So this was a fun little bout of copying and learning that way, but I think I will continue to dabble in all sorts of other things. Please do comment down below. Let me know if you were to try this experiment, if there's anything you would change. Let me know if you found yourself accidentally trying experiments like this. If you do something similar to me where, you know, you just read a lot of an author and then you find yourself why do you like that author? <laughs> let me know who your favorite author is or let me know if there's a particular author even that you can recognize has a very unique style and that it resonates with a lot of people but doesn't resonate with you. I talked about this in the author tube chat with Jessica Williamson recently where there's a couple famous authors you know they're they're beloved by so many people but I just can't get into their style and it's always nice to remind yourself of that as a creative um that you know not everything is for everyone and that is okay too but thank you so much to my patrons for deciding on this video I had a blast and thank you all so much again for watching I will see you all very soon with a new video